When I was in high school, there was a new show that came out that I just loved, and I watched it every Sunday night. It was called America's Funniest Home Videos. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, yes. Okay. While well, you're clapping for it, okay. Um, the, <laughs> the truth is, is that since that show, there are tons of shows that have come out since that are just like it. And this culture calls basically what they show over and over again are the, as epic fails. Epic fails. So it's, it's basically videotaping people making really poor decisions or, or people uh, uh, hurting themselves somehow or falling down or whatever. And so there's, there's all kinds of shows like Ridiculousness and there's some on Comedy uh, Central and stuff like that. It, it, basically, they just make money off of showing other people messing up. Now, I wanted to start off this message because we're going to be talking today about epic fails, not showing uh, people messing up or making poor choices, uh, but some animals making some poor choices. And I always like to start off with cats. So if you're a cat lover, uh, you may not like this one, but you might like the second one. But, but here's the first one, a cat that maybe has been watching a few too many Marvel movies. Here we go. <laughs> That's just funny to me. <laughs> like, but I can't show a cat video without showing a dog video. Now, I really like this particular dog video. You may have seen it before. Uh, but this dog fails in a way that my dog fails uh, with a few times, or does quite a bit, with failing in his dreams. Like, my dog will start having dreams, and they'll start shaking, and they'll start, you can tell that they're having a reaction, you know, from what's going on in their dream, kind of like this dog. So something's messing with him. Oh, oh, I think he's, he's got to start running from it. He's running. He's running. <laughs> oh, he wakes up, starts to wake up and, oh, right into the wall. <laughs> well, those are epic fails. And the truth is, is that we will go through life and we are going to have Epic fails. Some are small. Some, you know, we, we may think are epic at the time, but they're really small uh, in the grand scheme of things. But then we'll have major epic fails. Maybe a poor decision that we've made. Maybe it's a sin habit that we've gotten into uh, that's gotten a lot of control. Or maybe it's a secret sin. Maybe in your life it's such an epic fail that you don't want anybody to find out about it. The truth is, is that we are going to fail in life. We are going to make poor decisions. We are going to make stupid choices. And if we're not careful, we can allow those choices to dictate how our life is lived in the future. Now, anytime we make an epic failure or make some decision that's poor or go into some type of sin habit that's not good, it's always good to go to the Word of God because God's Word is living. And it's supposed to be our manual for life. It's supposed to guide us through those times when we make these poor decisions. And I think that when we look at a person's life and we look at how somebody has come out of epic failures, probably the best person to look at is the life of David. Now, I love the story of David. David, as we know, was a man after God's own heart. He was a worshiper, but yet he was a warrior. David was anointed as king very, very young. And while he was still a boy, he slew Goliath, which was this major victory for Israel. Uh, not long after that, he uh, eventually became king after Saul. And he really united all the tribes of Israel together, all 12 tribes of Israel together. And this guy had it all. He had power. He had wealth. He had women. I mean, all of the things that men would, would, would go after and, and, and be, be trying, trying to become powerful, this guy had it. And we probably won't be able to relate as much to his successes because of what he did, but more towards his failures. Because even though David had these great victories, he also had a lot 
of epic failures. One in particular, and we know the story. If you grew up in Sunday school, you probably remember the story of him and Bathsheba. Remember the story goes that he was basically, he's supposed to be out at war, but he wasn't. He stayed home while the rest of the armies were out fighting. And he was out on his veranda one day and he looked out upon his kingdom and he saw a woman that was bathing naked on a rooftop. Now, what we're supposed to do in those situations is look away, right? But he didn't. He had a lust issue. And if we see David's life, we see that his bigness, biggest weakness is women. He had all kinds of wives. He had all kinds of concubines, which was not okay with God. A lot of people think, well, that was just the custom of the day. God warned the kings of Israel not to do this. He did not want them to have multiple wives and all these concubines. He didn't want them to do it. And it is amazing to me that he had all of those wives, all of those concubines, yet it still wasn't enough. As he looked at this girl, he lusted after her, which caused him to call her to his bedroom. He slept with her, and he got her pregnant. Okay, some epic failures right there. Now, if David would have just recognized, hey, that was a failure, you know, like the cat jumping off the ledge there, okay? He failed. I messed up. That was not a good choice, but he didn't. Instead, what he did was, it was what we, most of us do, or we try to cover it up. So he thinks to himself, okay, what is a good plan to make it look like I'm not the father of this baby? So he sends for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, who is out fighting for him on the battlefield. And he puts, gives him basically a, a weekend pass or a leave. And he brings him to his palace and he, he has this party and he gets him drunk. And he figures, like most men that have been away from their wives for a long period of time, he is going to go and sleep with his wife. But Uriah doesn't do that. Uriah is so noble, he is so loyal that he says, how King David can I go and sleep with my wife and sleep in my bed when I know all of my friends, all the other soldiers for Israel are out fighting. They're out sleeping on the cold ground. I will not do so. So David's plan didn't work. He had to send Uriah back out to the, uh, back out to the battlefield. So then he decided, I'm going to take it one step further. And he told his generals, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put Uriah on the front line. And when the battle gets the craziest, I want you to pull back and leave Uriah by himself. Generals are like, are you sure? Yep, I'm sure. Okay, you're the king. That's what we'll do. And that's exactly what they did. And Uriah, and Uriah died as a result. So David thought, yes, I got it. Like, it's all covered up. Nobody ever has to know. Now I'll do the noble thing, and I'll bring her into my harem, and I'll make her my wife. I'll sleep with her. Then I'll have an excuse for why she's having a kid. So he does this. He thinks, all right, everything's good. It's all been swept under the rug. Awesome. But about a year goes by where David does not repent. David does not, realize, or does not recognize that he's, he's done wrong. He does not ask for forgiveness. And as a result of that, it starts eating away at him. Now, we've all had epic failures. But do we allow them to go on in our life in a way to where they'll just eat at us? Do we, do we, do we try to cover them up or do we take responsibility? Do we try to sweep it under the rug or do we try to deal with it? Well, David, in this case, did not deal with it. And that's where we pick up in verse, uh, chapter uh, 11 of 2 Samuel, verse 26. The Bible says, when Bathsheba heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was very displeased with what David had done. So chapter 12, verse 1, so the Lord sent Nathan, a prophet, to tell David this story. So David wouldn't come, to, uh, David wouldn't come clean with God. He wouldn't admit what he'd done. He, he just swept it under the rug to the point where God says, all right, then I'm going to have to send somebody in. I'm going to send my prophet in. And the prophet goes to David and he tells him this story. He says, there were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but a little lamb he had worked hard to buy. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing a lamb from his own flock for food, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and served it to the guests. David was furious. 
As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you're the man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you his house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah and stolen his wife. David had fallen so far into sin. And so far into this dark place in his mind that Nathan told a story of what David had done and David didn't recognize it. That's how far he had buried it. And I think one of the things that hurts the most in that scripture is when God tells David all the things he'd given him and then he told him, I'd have given you so much more if you just asked for it. I know for me, when I go through those times in my life where I'm dealing with some epic failure, I'm dealing with some sin habit that I've struggled with over and over again, when I I mess up again, I know that when I go before the Lord and I ask for forgiveness, in my mind I'm like, God, I I can't believe I've done this again. I can't believe I made this poor choice again. After how you have blessed me, after how much you have taken care of me, I mean, God, you blessed me with such a great family. You've blessed me with such a great home. You blessed me with such a great church. You just, you blessed me in so many ways. How, how in the world do I still make the choice to sin? How do I still make those poor choices and those poor decisions? And the truth is, is that even though I love God, my nature is to sin. Even though I love him and he's done so much for me, I'm still going to mess up. And you know what? He knows that. And he loves me anyway. That's the part that we have such a hard time tackling as humans. We have such a hard time wrapping our mind around is that God blesses us with so much and we do so many stinky things, yet he still loves us so much. That's, That's so hard for us to grasp. And in this situation, God goes before David through a prophet. And it's like, dude, I, I give you so much. Come on. All I'm asking you to do is recognize what you've done. Now, we've all had our share of secret sins that we, we didn't want anybody to know about. Okay, we've got to be honest. And some of us right now, you may have some secret sins that you think if somebody finds out about it, it's going to ruin me. It's absolutely going to devastate my life. I've got to keep it hidden. But the scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. Nathan didn't know that Dave, what David had done. He wasn't there when David had made those decisions and had, had sown all that deception. God told David, because God knows everything. So Nathan is sent in, Nathan is sent in to uh, 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 confront David and to confront this sin. And and, and the truth is, is that he is used in such a beautiful way to turn David's life around. That we have to ask ourselves the question, is there somebody in our life like that? Is there somebody that we are close enough to that will tell us the truth even though it may hurt? Do you have that kind of friend? Do you have that kind of accountability partner? That's why we say right here, you got to get into a small group. You need those, those friends that will call you on the carpet if you, if you need to be called on the carpet. And then if you do, do you listen to them when they try to tell you that you're doing something wrong? Oh, that's, that's a big one. Have you ever done that maybe for somebody else? I mean, I, I know for me, I've, I've gone to a few people that, that I thought I was really close to, and I called them on the carpet on something and the, that they were doing in their life, and I tried to do it biblically. You know, I asked for God for, to give me discernment and to give me timing and to soften their heart. And when I brought it to their attention, they blew up. They, like, lost their mind on me. They just got so mad that I would bring that up in their life. And in those moments, it made me realize, oh, I hope. In Jesus' name, help me to always stay teachable. Because the moment we stop listening to Nathan's are the moments that we stop growing. The moment that we stop listening to people in our life that love us are the moments that we are going to go down a downward spiral that we may not be able to get out of without just the grace of God. We've got to be teachable. 
we have to listen to the Nathans in our life. We have to say, okay, God, make me teachable. Make me moldable. Make me listen. Don't get me so prideful that I think I know it all or I think I have everything under control. God loves you so much. Let him put people in your life that will be a Nathan, that will call you on the carpet when you need it. Now, this truly is the beginning of David's turnaround. Even though a year has gone by, this prophet speaks into him, and he finally listens. And in verse 13, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, many people don't have a Nathan that can call him on the carpet. But if you don't, seek one out. I have a group of guys. I talked to, talked to you guys about these guys last, uh, last time I spoke. They're an accountability group of pastors. We meet together every other Wednesday, and we call each other out on stuff. How you doing in this area? How you doing in this? And that spot in your life that you struggle with, because you know what? We all have our hot buttons, and I don't even have to say that without you going in your mind of what yours is. Is it lying? Is it cheating? Is it gossiping? What is your epic failures? David, he broke three of the Ten Commandments in like a week. Those are monster failures. But we have our own too. And, the, and as soon as we recognize that and, and say, yep, God, these, this is my issue, so help me to find somebody in my life that I can come out of the closet with. I can tell them I struggle with lust. I struggle with pornography. I struggle with, with spend, overspending. I, I have no self-control. What is it? And bring it before somebody that can hold you accountable. It will, it will change your life, just like it did David's. And the wonderful thing about Scripture is it's broken down in a way where you might be reading in one, one book about the history of David and the story we just read, like in 2 Samuel, but then you can turn to Psalms 51, and you can peek inside the king of Israel's prayer life and what he said to God after he messed up. What he said to God after he came clean. And that's what we see in Psalms 51. And it's beautiful. His words are, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Isn't that awesome? That, that the leader, the king of a nation cries out to God. For I recognize my shameful deeds. They haunt me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the heart, so you can teach me to be wise in my inmost being. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow." Oh, give me back my joy again. You ever had a sin that was plaguing you so bad, a poor decision that plagued you so bad that it stole your joy? You weren't, you weren't happy anymore. You couldn't enjoy life. You couldn't enjoy your families. You couldn't enjoy your, your vacations because that sin, that epic fail, had such, a, had such a hold on you that you didn't have joy anymore. You have broken me, he says. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. He's like, God, I, my spirit's not even right. It's, it's twisted. It's wrong. It's dark. Give me a new spirit. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He knew what it was like or had seen what had happened when the Holy Spirit left a person. Saul lost the Holy Spirit. Saul messed up enough that finally God was like, you know what, I'm done. I can't deal with you anymore. So Saul once had the Spirit and lost it. And in Old Testament times, that could happen. In New Testament times, we don't have to worry about that. When we receive, when we receive Christ, when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You remember when you got saved? Do you remember the joy that you had, that, that exuberance you had because you had been given the, the gift of grace and salvation? He's saying, I want that back, God. I don't have it anymore. And make me willing to obey you. I love that. That shows that sometimes in our life with those epic failures or those sin patterns, 
we don't really want to get better. We don't really want to obey God. He's saying, I just need your help wanting to obey. Give me the strength not to go down that dark road anymore. Help me not to go make those decisions. Help me not to go into that escapism sin. Then I will teach your ways to sinners and they will return to you. He's saying, God, if you forgive me, I'm going to return to you. And then I'm going to speak to others about the issues that I've had to help them. I'm going to relate to him. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that I may praise you. You would not be pleased with sacrifices, or I'd bring them. If I brought you a burnt offering, you would not accept it. He's saying right now, I could could bring you a thousand oxen and sacrifice all of them to you. But that's not really what you want. And then he says what he wants. The sacrifice you want is a broken spirit. A broken and repentant heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Now, I don't know you, where you are in your life. Maybe you have dealt with your epic failures. Maybe you have moved past them, but maybe not. Maybe you're holding on to them. Maybe they plague you and they make you feel so guilty and so shameful that you have a hard time even praying to God. You think, I can't serve because I'm not worthy. The devil has played a trick on you to think that grace doesn't really apply to you. You don't get forgiveness. But when we face those epic failures, go to Psalms 51. Personalize David's prayer as your own. And it will lead you down the steps of success, getting over those epic failures. The first thing that we see David do in uh, uh, verse 1 and 2 is he just asks for forgiveness. And he does it in such a beautiful way. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. That's coming from a guy that knows what guilt and shame feels like. He's saying, wash me clean. And sometimes we get so deep into our mess that we don't even want to ask for forgiveness because we feel like hypocrites going before God. Or we think that God doesn't want to talk to us or that God doesn't want to forgive us. Yet God is saying, I love you just the way you are. I knew the mistakes you're going to make before you make them. Yet I still sent my son to die for you. I will forgive you no matter what. Just come and ask. I love that picture of a king coming before the king of kings and just saying, forgive me, wash, wash me clean. And then verse 3, three, three and 4, he, he does something else there. As a, as a king of Israel that is supposedly above the law, he takes responsibility for what he's done. You see, you can ask for forgiveness, not take responsibility. It's culturally acceptable now for us to just lay blame on everybody else. If we mess up, oh, we got to cover it up. We got, oh, it was their fault. That's not what I meant. That's not really what I said. They did it. It was them. You know, they just, they misunderstood the situation. And so what we do, we just try to talk ourselves out. When in reality, what we could do is give our boss the greatest gift and just go, yep, I screwed up. I own it. I'll wear it. I take responsibility. And that's what David does in this situation. He, He takes responsibility for what he's done. He says, for I recognize my shameful deeds. He didn't say, but God, she was bathing naked on, on the rooftop. It's really her fault. Okay? He took responsibility. Nathan came and confronted him. He didn't, he didn't redirect and create a smoke screen and go, yeah, but Nathan, I, I know what you've done. I, I know some of the stuff that you've done in your life. No, he took responsibility. They haunt me day and night. You ever felt haunted? Against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. The best thing we can do in an epic failure situation is ask for forgiveness and then just say, God, I blew it. I did it. I made that poor choice. It's nobody's fault but my own. And then he prays three things I think that are just incredible, which is what we got to do next. We just got to pray. He says, create in me a new heart. The NIV says, a pure heart. He recognized, I'm a mess, God. Give me a new heart because mine's messed up. Create in me a new heart. Then he says, renew in me a right spirit because my spirit is all jacked up. I need a new one. 
And then he says, make me willing to obey you. And the NIV NIV says, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God, help me to obey because I'm not good at it. I need your help. And then in verse 17, we see that he allows himself to be broken. He allows himself to be broken. Verse 17, the sacrifice you want is a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart of God you will not despise. If you want to get back into the good graces of your heavenly father, be broken before him. Be transparent. Be real. Just go before him and say, I blew it and I'm sorry. Over and over again in scripture, we see David write songs to God. And in them, he talks about how he will cry out to the Lord. And after it says cry out, it usually ends with an exclamation mark. So that doesn't mean that just within my spirit I cried out. It means I cry out to you, God. I've blown it. I am a royal screw up. Please help me. Please forgive me. Please cleanse me. Please get me back on the right track. I cannot do it without you. David blew it bigger than any of us will ever blow it, yet God still loved him so much. All he had to do was say he was sorry. All he had to do was take responsibility. All he had to do is pray to God, and and God was just like what we would be to our kids. Come here and give me a hug. I love you. Yep, you really blew it. Let me dust you off, you dirty little snoot. Come here. He loves us that much. So what is it within you today that is stealing your joy? What is it today that is causing you to live under God's grace? What is it that is causing you to think that I am not worthy to serve him? I am not worthy to even pray to him. What is it? Did God not die for all of our sins? Did Jesus' sacrifice not cover it all? Do you really think that your sin is worse than somebody else's? Jesus' attitude is it's all sin. I died for all of it. But he died so he can spend life with us. How cool is that? So what I want to do to close the service out this morning is as you stand with me, I want us just to pray together. And I want you guys just to bring the house lights down because I want this to be very intimate between you and the Lord. The first thing I want you to do is I just want you to ask for forgiveness. Ask God for forgiveness, whatever it is. Forgive me for that divorce that I have to take responsibility for. Forgive me for that abortion that has made me feel like I wasn't good enough to serve or or even praise you. Forgive me for cheating. Forgive me for lying. Forgive me for gossiping. sin is, I want you just to give it over to to him right now. Just lay it at his feet. Isn't it time? Isn't it time for you to stop carrying that weight? So Lord, we just ask for forgiveness. And as we do that, we take responsibility. Whatever we did to be a part of that epic failure, we own it. But now we lay it at your feet, God, because we can't handle the weight anymore. And I pray, Lord, as, as we do that, I pray that you would bind the spirit of guilt and shame, bind up that spirit of condemnation, and I pray that you cast it out of this room in Jesus' name. Cast it away from us. And instead, I pray that you would lay upon us a garment of grace. We would feel your forgiveness in a new way this morning like never before. Take 
this weight off us, that we, that we would literally feel lighter. And Lord, as we do this, I pray right now that you'd created us a new heart. Just pray, tell, ask Jesus right now, just say, give me a new heart. Ask him to renew a right spirit within you. Ask him to make you willing to obey in the future. Now ask him to renew a spirit of joy in you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would release joy into this place, that you would loose joy into all of us. You'd help us start start being present with our family. You'd help us to start enjoying vacations and enjoying time off. That you would help us, Lord God, to have the abundant life that you've promised. That you would give us joy and joy everlasting. And I pray, Lord, when we have those epic failures in the future, we turn to Psalm 51. That we would read a prayer of a king that blew it way worse than we did. And yet you welcomed him back. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. Thank you for giving us a million and one chances. Thank you, God, for that. We love you. He's telling you love him. Let's close with a praise offering, shall we? To our Heavenly Father who loves us more than we could ever imagine. All right, guys, God bless you. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Invite a friend and come back next week. We'll see you then.